Okay, welcome to the commentary for the No Belief article and lessons. I'm just going to chat about my ideas on this topic. First of all, this comes from Robert Anton Wilson. He's the guy who wrote the main article. And Robert Anton Wilson is a very interesting guy. Uh, very, very interesting guy. He, uh, he's kind of a part philosopher, part um, activist. He's a writer. Um, anyway, he's got a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, I like him. He, he likes to challenge the status quo. Status quo meaning what is normal, what everyone believes. He likes to challenge dogma. Uh, people have so many strong beliefs, and he likes to challenge those beliefs. So that's why I like him. I guess I feel the same way. And this little, I guess you would call it an essay, this little essay he wrote called No Belief or I Have No Beliefs uh, is very interesting. And it basically discusses the danger of belief itself. And here what we're talking about is belief meaning you think something is correct and you have this 100% idea, this is definitely right and this is definitely wrong. This is definitely true. This is definitely false. That's a belief, a strong belief. And I think he's really talking about strong belief. I mean, we all have ideas. We all have certain beliefs. We think we know something. But what Robert Anton Wilson is talking about is we must always remember that we can never be 100% sure. We might be 90% sure. We might be 40% sure, but never 100%. There is no definite reality where we can always say we know for sure absolutely and I like that and I think he's absolutely correct and his idea I think uh, is appropriate can be applied at, at a very large level a very deep level and also at a kind of very small practical level at a big deep level what he's talking about in terms of reality <clears throat> are these questions of religion and philosophy and science. What is real? And what is life? That's a very deep question. <laughs> and he talks about this idea that in the past, uh, especially he, he refers to European thought, uh, that this medieval period, people believe that the world was made of things, solid things. And of course, our normal reality, that, that's what we that's what we see. You pick up a pen, it seems like a, a nice hard thing. And you pick, and then you have a desk, it's a hard, solid thing. And the idea is that all of reality is these little blocks, these little pieces of hard things. And that was a view in the Western world for many years. Until science, especially physics, began to question that belief question that idea. And physics, as physicists, began to explore the atom. And they went even farther, smaller and smaller and smaller. Physics began to realize, uh-oh, it's not true. The world, reality, things appear like they're hard and solid, but in fact, they are made of energy. They're made of moving uh, processes. They're made of things that are not solid things that change constantly, that are flowing, that are moving, electrons and magnetic energy and all these things, and that this idea of solid, separate things is something that our mind creates, that our senses and our mind, our, eye, our senses meaning our eyes, our ears, our nose, and then of course our brains also, that we take all this information, all these waves, all this energy, all these patterns, and we make them with our minds into separate items. But in fact, nothing is actually separate. Um, what's interesting and what he talks about is how this f idea of science, of, of especially advanced science, agrees with uh, mysticism. And mysticism is a word, it can have a lot of different feelings depending on who's using it. But mysticism basically means direct religion. Religion based on observation, religious based on meditation. So a religion that is not based on belief or some dogmatic 
rules or a book. So Buddhism, for example, is kind of a mystical religion. Uh, it's based on meditation and observation. Hinduism, to a large part, is at least parts of Hinduism. And it's interesting, so he's saying, and, and parts of Christianity too, as a matter of fact. So anyway, these, mystis, these mystical, as the adjective, these mystical religions or religious sects, religious groups, uh, in fact, agree, their, their understanding, their ideas, agree with the physicist ideas. And that is that, in fact, everything changes and nothing is solid and separate. Quite interesting. So that's at the big level, the big philosophical, religious, spiritual level, this idea of dogma, strong belief, right? And of course, we see the negative effects of dogma in politics in the world all the time. Uh, we have dogmatic Christians who believe the Bible is the word of God and God wrote it and it's 100% absolutely true, exactly true, and nothing else is. And therefore, it's okay to kill other people who don't believe it or at least condemn them and attack them. Uh, so that's an, a dogmatic belief, right? The Bible is 100% right. Everyone else is 100% wrong. And this, this, I, this dogma, these dogmatic beliefs cause a lot of problems in the world and in personal relationships too. But at a smaller level, at a smaller level, in our own lives, uh, this idea is also important, I think. In my own life it is that we have to remind ourselves all the time that our beliefs are not sure. We can never be totally sure. I have strong ideas, for example, about teaching English. I have very strong ideas. What I think is correct, what I think works, what I think is the best way to do it, and what I think is not. Now, these ideas, they're not random. Uh, I've read a lot of research. I have a master's degree in teaching English as a foreign language, and I had to read a lot of lots and lots and lots of research studies. I also have 10 years of experience, so I've seen a lot of students. I've examined how they learn, how they study, which students learn faster, which ones do better. So I have reasons for my beliefs. However, I have to always remember that I, I can't let this become a dogma. A, a, I can't let myself have total certitude. I have to remember that next week, next month, there might be new research, right? Someone might develop a new technique for teaching language, and maybe that technique will be better than the storytelling technique. Maybe it will be better than what I do in my class or what we do at Effortless English. And I need to be open. I need to remember that because if someone creates a better method, well, I want to use that method, right? I don't want to be stuck with what I have now. That's the idea of always, always being a little bit unsure. It's okay to be unsure. In fact, it's very good to say, you know, I'm not totally sure. So for myself, I try to remember that. I also try to remember it in my general life, my personal life, with my friends, with my other relationships, that I think I'm right. We all think we're right, right? We all pretty sure I'm right. I know I'm right. But in fact, maybe we're wrong. And we should always remember there is a chance that we're wrong, or at least mistaken. All right. And I think this comes down to finally that both at a large level in terms of religion, at our work, and in our personal lives, we always need to question. We always have to ask questions. We always have to be reflecting about our lives. Am I doing what is best? Is what I'm doing now still working? Is there new information I could be using? Has the situation changed? Maybe what I did used to be the best, used to be good, but maybe now the situation is different and I need to change. So we always have to keep questioning, keep questioning, never be sure. It's okay, I like this idea, to say, I have no strong beliefs. I'm always a little bit unsure. I never know 100%. I never have total certitude. That's how we grow. That's how we remain creative. That's how we keep getting better, keep innovating, keep succeeding with our lives uh, in all aspects of our lives. 
So anyway, uh, it's a nice idea. I think Robert Anton Wilson says it much better than I do. Uh, hopefully I can say it with a little bit simpler English. Uh, his article is a little bit difficult. So if you had problems with his article, if it seems difficult, just relax, no problem. Focus on the mini story for a while and focus on reading it and then start listening to the audio article and you know just repeat it. Uh, the great thing about effortless English, you don't need to feel stress. Anytime you have an article that is difficult for you, just relax, just listen to it more. <laughs> That's a simple solution. Sometimes you can understand an article completely after one week. Sometimes you might need to listen to it every day for one month. Sometimes you might need to you know, forget about it for a while and come back, try it again after three months, after six months. It's okay, no problem. Focus on the lessons that are easiest for you, that are the best for you. Sometimes you can do all of them. Sometimes maybe focus on the mini story. Use what works for you. This is your club, so use what works for you. Alrighty, I will see you next time. Bye-bye.